Thank you, Colin. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm just going to say yeah and just kind of move forward. I completely forgot what I was talking about. But some of the things that really, or one of the things that really stuck to me, where is it, was social ability, like that aspect and idea behind it. Uh, being in like the fields and stuff that I work in, I believe that it's something that should be true for most cases. Um, yes, there are injustices and things of that nature, but I mean, if the person is someone who can overall make the society better and help everyone, and if it keeps the society working and striving towards their one goal, I think the sacrifice is something that needs to be made, personally. Um, Can you give an example? Like, if a minor injustice to my eyes would be like littering or speeding or, I don't even really, like, small levels of stealing, I guess, too, but if the person is creating a, a genuine cure for cancer or something of that nature, or it's a political figure that is loved by everyone, and if that figure is put into horrible shame and things of that nature, then it would disrupt the whole society. And if the society disrupts, then it'll crash and burn. So it would kind of have like a whole new uprising in the power vacuum and if you lose power when you're at the top it's going to be bad I don't know my brain goes to like worst case scenario if the person fails then everything just disrupts on itself what about I mean Bill Clinton had trouble with women and other people would say, yeah, but his policies were good and he was creating a middle class. And on the other hand, Trump also has problem with women and people all also seem to not care. So if they can finish their job, like the presidency, if they could finish their job and then be held accountable after they are out of office when someone else is in that position of power, I think that is better than putting the person who is in power, no matter who they are, under fire. Because if we're in a split uh, political system right now, and it's very, very split, so any slight issue will completely push it one way or the other. And it's been having like a rubber banding effect for the last couple of years. If... Trump's case came out after or Clinton's after and like he was persecuted to the full of everything after he was out I think it would have helped a lot who knows what else Clinton could have do and who knows uh, uh what else Trump could have done I I agree like I don't agree with whatever what they did but if there's a way that they can continue to function then come back to the fact but those, in my opinion, aren't minor injustices either. Right. Yes. That's true. Those are uh, not minor. Um, yep, yeah, to comment on that. Uh, so, like, are you suggesting that they should have stayed in office instead of been brought to court? Not, I agree that they should have been brought to court, but I don't think they should have been brought to court during their office term. I... If, oh, sorry, go ahead. Like Clinton, for example, if being brought in the middle of his term, who knows what he could, or towards the end, who knows what they could have done. We'll keep them accountable, but it would be after the fact. I mean, it was already, for some of the cases, it was already way past the fact that was being brought back up. At that point, splitting the union more, splitting 
the party not really the parties but like support i don't know once one thing comes out then everyone's gonna hate the president another thing comes out they're gonna love the president it's just all a weird slippery slope that you get into but those aren't like minor injustices i was i was thinking of oh somebody um oh i you know, there's you spread false rumors. Sometimes there's rumors around lying, and but and you have to just sort of believe. Right. What? It's not lying. It's like the president of the United States. Yeah. No. So I. Yeah. That was not a good example because I actually. It is polarizing. What about if you're just on campus? and you hear a rumor about somebody and you hear a rumor about you and it depends upon how serious it is, right? There are certain slights that maybe you should let go and other ones that you really have to hold the people accountable for spreading the rumor. So yeah, I do think that the president example was not a good example. It and it does polarize people again. And um, anyway, let's let's go on to some of the other virtues. So, who would like to go next? Um, I'll I'll go. Um, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, Jordan talked about. Oh, even um, Lex was talking about like happiness and whatnot, and that made me um, think of one of my points, which was the pleasure that comes from making a profit, the economic sector. And that was one of the, like the political virtues. And that just made me think of like, kind of like, what do we consider happy? And the idea of like, does make, does money make people happy? Because I always, I mean, I always ask that question and I get like so many different answers for me personally. I think money is very important for me and making money does make me happy because it allows me to have the experience like to I guess buy the experience or at least the opportunity to make an experience so for example money does make me happy because that gives me the opportunity to buy a plane ticket to go on a trip therefore meeting new people exploring new cultures that's one of my worldview points that I think um, is important for me and, and my life so I feel like in my sense, yes, it does make me happy. Not saying that people can't be depressed with money, but um, money can help. Like it can help with treatment. It can help me with medication. And so that's just my opinion. Is there excess and defect? I mean, is there valuing it too much, too little? Yeah, for sure. I also think it like differs how much money would mean to someone. So like a hundred dollars to me would mean like, that's great, but I'm not like hungry every single day. A hundred dollars to a family in need is like meal for a week. It's like, you know, it differs like, and I think money does equal happiness, especially in like an economic state, like the United States does determine your level of happiness, how able you are to get a job, to look wealth, to get a job. Like homeless people, part of the reasons why they remain homeless is because they don't have any way to look presentable for a job. You know, stuff like that. I also agree with that. Money does not create happiness, but there is a difference from being broke, poor, and being happy than being rich and being happy. Like you see all the time in books where there's the rich stereotype who has all the money in the world, but he's super sad inside. And then you see the poor person who's struggling, but they have a family who loves them and it's happy. That's not always the case. Like money is the ability to relieve stress because money also causes the stress. So you have to think about it in the middle ground. Like my family is well off where I don't have to st stress about money as much, but there was a time in my life where my mom went to bed without food because I was a athlete who was 12 years old and I needed to eat she had to give up her meal so I could have seconds. Like there's complete difference. You have to like find the balance and the understanding. So that's why Aristotle emphasizes a middle class, right? 
So to be a good political leader is to know how to weave together the rich and poor and have a large and stable middle class. So people aren't desperate or they aren't isolated. The rich get isolated from other people and they don't have any empathy. Does that make sense? Again, I interrupted, but <laughs> yeah, that's what he means by pleasure from profit. If you're a good at statecraft, you can actually figure out how to do it. Um, Zane, you want to go? Uh, yeah, um, I guess I was going to agree along with uh, kind of what they're saying, like money, like, I know, obviously it's not happiness in itself, but obviously, I mean, it, it can relieve a lot of stress in a way, but I agree with like the middle class thing. I think that's, I mean, best because I mean, just, I mean, in any economic system, obviously having a bigger middle class, I believe just, uh, you know, creates a lot more success and a lot less stress. So I believe, or I mean, I agree with all of that. Is there anything else you came to class wanting to talk about? Um, I guess like just like the rest of the stuff, like when it came to, like I saw like where it said like courage is like dealing like with death and stuff like that. I mean, I just found that interesting and stuff and uh just kind of like what you know, like what is courage and kind of like what makes it and stuff. So but uh yeah, I mean that's just kind of all I came with. I came I, I was a little bit short notice, has been a lot today, so that's my apologies. Okay. Okay, Alexis, that's good. Okay, Michael. Um, yeah, so just to kind of bring it back to some of the points that people made, um, I think that uh, somebody made a comment about Aristotle's virtues um, being about our like <laughs> individualized um, pursuit of happiness. Um, and Jordan made a comment that I agreed with about it being very similar, similar to individual's pursuit of happiness, but I think that his virtues were also um, a, a way for like, a, for like a, a united pursuit of happiness, if you will. Um, so like for, for a nation to have a, a pursuit of happiness as a, as a, as a whole, um, each individual kind of has to do their part. Um, and then just to chime in on the, um, the like having money uh, and happiness uh, thing we're talking about. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with like the societal expectations of like what we get out of money as well. Um, I think like, uh, I don't know, obviously like money kind of runs the country, but I think there's a lot of ways um, that, um, I think that like we've lost a lot of uh, social interactions um, like like eating at the dinner table, for example, um, like that no longer happens. You know, I feel like we've lost a lot of social interactions that cost nothing, but definitely improved uh, happiness and quality of life uh, within families. Um, and then um, the first of my comments wasn't actually about uh, Aristotle's virtues. It was going to be about um, Plato's. Let's see. Fido. Oh, yeah, Prado, um, which I, I think kind of opens up a bigger conversation because uh, you asked us a question in a video. Well, uh, there was a list of questions, um, but assuming any of us could be convicted of a crime unjustly, what would you do? Um, and so I think that like uh, in, in Plato's uh, instance, he was being wrongfully con convicted. And so it's a much more complicated issue because um, it's more of almost a corrupt system at that point, you know? And although Plato went ahead and um, did exactly as the laws were, I don't know that that was the most just thing to do since he was wrongfully convicted in what some would argue in a corrupt system. And yeah, I think, I think I'm gonna end it there for now. Anybody else have a comment on Plato's credo? All right, so I think Michael made a really good point about the corrupt system, very similar to our system. Like if you don't trust the system that you're in, you don't trust it to prove your innocence. So what do you do in that instance? Do you try and do it yourself 
when you can't do you, who do you fall back on it's a really good question okay yeah I, yeah i always use the example for college students of sexual assault right um he said she said well what if you end up getting accused of sexual assault by a really rich girl who you know is going to get a lawyer that is going to get you in prison and you really didn't do it uh what would you do right um anyway so i'll i guess i'll start out with the credo and i was i was just going to chime in and say that like you brought up points in the video kind of just about how like unfair the justice system is uh with money um which you just again brought up like if there was a very rich individual you know um and how like it, it is not set up very well for people who don't have money, you know, in any circumstances you talked about uh, lawyers that were falling asleep during the trial and whatnot. I mean, it's a bit ridiculous, actually. Um, you know, at that point is something better than nothing. It, is it better that they have a lawyer there that is falling asleep as opposed to them defending themselves? I don't know. This was the case uh, in Texas with the death penalty. Um, the state is legally mandated to give people lawyers if they can't afford one. And so I'm one of, so there's a list of lawyers to pick and one of them had been debarred. <laughs> and, you know, so poor people get whatever, whoever ends up on the list. And of course the rich will get whatever they need. So I do, I do want you to, to point out that Aristotle did think that the political evil, there's lots of virtues and vices, right? The particular one that destroys political community is greed, wanting more than your share. Because if people are motivated just by greed, money will stick to money and you will not have a middle class. That doesn't mean, all that means is you don't raise your kid primarily for money. So children don't grow up saying, I will do whatever I need to do to make the most money. That will end up without a middle class. Does that make sense? So then you would pick something that you enjoy doing, that you can make a contribution, but also that it's reasonable to think you would have a decent middle class life. Um, you might, I mean, I knew with my kids, the skill set that my daughter had was going to lead her to make more money. It's just she has that skill set. And my son would be middle class. He's an educator. My oldest is a manager. She would make the most money just doing something naturally. My son is an educator. He would be middle class. And my youngest one sort of liked the arts. She was kind of artsy fartsy. <laughs> so she's gonna be the starving artist, except she eventually became an arts journalist. So she's a journalist, but I think she still gets paid the least. But does that make sense to y'all that, you know, they're all doing something they like and they're all managing to get in the middle class. That's all, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, you kind of you brought up like uh, educators and being in the middle class, which kind of reminds me of um, like uh, like teachers, um, but teachers that are struggling to like live in general, uh, like in public schools, um, which is kind of a huge problem because they are educating the citizens of tomorrow and can barely go home and keep the keep the lights on. Uh, actually, in California, there are teachers who are Uber drivers. You know, and so how do they, they can't assign them any papers. Anyway, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a big problem. Um, okay, so we can get more into that in a minute, but let's do the credo. So I really want you to think about this issue that the, the conclusion is that you have skin in the game it matters to you that our system works well because you could easily 
get unjustly accused of something and then you're really in trouble <laughs> okay but what were Crito's reasons um first of all I would lose a friend okay so Crito's wealthy and he has connections so as soon as Socrates gets accused he's really mad about it but okay he can bribe the guard he arranges for a ship to head out to Thessaly and he has friends there and they'll take care of him he can take his family he's got it all set up right and his reason one number one reason well I would lose a friend is that a good reason to break the laws I mean it depends on like why your friends arrested <laughs> like if my I've had friends arrested in protests and I 100% yeah I would break them out because I think they were protesting for the right thing and like similar to this Socrates was just you know asking people questions and then he got arrested and I'd be like yeah I'm gonna bust my homie out for real no so, but yeah. okay so your friend got arrested would they want to go underground and then never be able to be public again or would they just go into the jail and serve their 30 days or whatever and then get out what do you think jordan oh i just was using that as an example of like if we were back in our like more archaic times where if you were publicly protesting you might be put to death yeah i think they would like you know choose life over that but i think current day if, if anything it's better for them to serve like jail time to show yeah i believe in this cause right so it, it's different now but like back then socrates was gonna be put to death so yeah i think that you know it's an equal trade or like socrates could want to die for his beliefs and that's also i think admirable but i think it's up to socrates in the end because it's going to be his life to live okay yeah i do want to give you a i do want to make it impress upon you that these questions are really difficult so a number of you wrote about the youth fro and you know these people believe in what they're doing the trouble is Euthyphro was had strength in his convictions but so did Melitus Melitus also was strong in his convictions which caused him to want Socrates to die so so people really disagree and it's very complicated I guess I really want to impress that on you and this one also is really difficult um so and then what I'll do is I'll talk for a while and then everybody should react so um everybody has friends and family so if people thought well yeah I believe in the rule of law except when it's my friend or my family well basically you don't have laws then you don't have the rule of law all you have is that the rich can really get out of it and the poor are really screwed because they can't they don't have anywhere to run or you know they don't have enough money to bribe the guard or whatever anyway um have you ever broken a law right to protect a friend so that's problematic okay second one people wouldn't believe you refused they would think i was too cheap what does this tell you about athens <laughs> nobody believed in the rule of law right they they said i'm just i'm pissed at socrates especially for saying he deserves to be fed publicly for what he does like the athletes i mean i'm so pissed he's just trying to be annoying so I'm going to vote to have him killed and then Crito will get him out. No prob, right? And, you know, like you don't have the rule of law, right? It's it's uh, fake. It's lousy. But what about us? So one time, one of the Kennedy kids was accused of, of sexual assault. Well, what did people want them to do? On the one hand, they could just make the kid accountable you find a lawyer you take care of it just like everybody else on the other hand we could get the the you know most expensive lawyer in the country and you can get off well what would people want them to do of course what they did is got f lee bailey the most expensive lawyer and he got the kid off but is that really the rule of law if that's the way it operates 
And what that is, is the way greed corrupts the system. If you're rich enough, you know, you'll never suffer for criminal behavior. So, and in some sense, people even want that. They would be, they would be surprised and disagree if you have the money and you didn't pay for a rich lawyer. You know what I mean? I, I think people are, you really need to think about it. What it does it mean to live under a society based on the rule of law? The other issue is that Crito thinks he's saving Socrates, but his lack of respect for the laws was, was part of the problem. It created this instability, which caused Mimelitus and others to want to find someone to blame. So, so does everyone understand that? That Crito thought he was the solution and he's really part of the problem. And I think that's true of Euthyphro too. He thinks, ah, we got to get back to the Bible, get back to Homer. And he ends up doing something that really throws people off. And so then, is he really part of the solution or really part of the problem? Same with Melitus. So we do have to be careful about that. Um, the second, the third reason. Our, our friends are willing to make this sacrifice. So is this courage? Is that they'll risk losing their reputations or whatever for their friend? Is that courage? Open question, right? There are other places you can go. And this is where I really think Americans or my students really believe they can just, it, you know, if they get falsely accused, and they can get out, they'll get out. Well, where are they supposed to go? And if they have children, what are the children's options? So you can go to some remote place in Africa or some remote island somewhere, but you then, you know, you don't have much of a life, but your children have no life, right? And people will say, your dad is a criminal, he's a fugitive, and they have no way to participate in public life, anything. They won't get educated, they won't get jobs, they won't, nothing. Whereas if they stayed in Athens, they would have all this opportunity to develop as human beings. And the problem is if Crito tells them, your dad was a jerk, I gave him a chance to escape and now you're orphans. Or if Crito tells them, your dad cared more that you would have a decent life. And so he accepted the punishment, right? And, you know, Crito has a lot of power over the attitude of those children. Um, not total, but I mean, he can mess things up. Um, so I do think you need to think about this, that it's, it's important that the system works. And when it doesn't work, everybody suffers and everybody's life is more precarious. Um, you're playing into the hands of your enemies. This is another thing about polarization. No matter what the one side does, the other side uh, demonizes that person. And it's terrible, right? So um, Socrates says, if I escape, my enemies will say, see, he really is a lawless person. It doesn't respect the gods. If he stays, you see, he's really admitting that he was guilty. I mean, you're, you're not going to win. Your enemies are going to do that to you. Do you sometimes get defensive about something you did that might be questionable? Um, because someone you don't like believes it is, and you don't want to admit that they are right, right? And you should be testing yourself for this, right? So that if a critical moment comes, can you handle it? And the last one is you're betraying your children. Um, and he did worry about that. He's got to leave. He's, he's got to trust Crito and, and his friends to educate his children. And he says, I want you to tell them they should love virtue and justice more than money and power. But what about the children, you know? Would the children resent their parents? If, well, I mean, my dad marched in Selma, so I remember this. And my friend said to me, well, your dad is almost a communist, you know, 
And I had teachers who didn't like me because my dad was the local communist and all that. So every time your parents speak out, yeah, the kids are going to get demonized, right? Various kinds of fault rumors and all that stuff. On the other hand, if you watch your society decline and you don't do anything, then your kids grow up and say, well, why didn't you do anything, <laughs> right? Why didn't, do you see what I mean? So I do think parenting is difficult and you're always having to make those decisions. How much should I speak out and how much should I put up and shut up so that my children can have a decent life? Well, it's complicated. Um, would you be critical of your parents or proud of them if they stood up for what they believed, even if it involved risks or it involved people saying nasty things to you about your parents? What does it mean to be a responsible parent? So I want you to, you know, I'm going to ask people to respond to any of these points, but let me finish the outline. And I, I do want to call on all of you. A good person doesn't worry about what they think, whoever they is, right? You only ask what's the right thing to do. A good person will never allow reason um, to be corrupted by peer pressure, pressure from other people. Not mere life, but the good life is the life worth living. A good person never does wrong intentionally. They might think they're doing right. They might be a tragic character, they have good intentions and they make a mistake and hopefully they would learn from their mistakes, but they never deliberately do something they think is wrong. A good person doesn't injure anyone and, it, and doesn't retaliate. That's why Socrates says, I'm not going to injure my political system and I'm not gonna retaliate, I'm not gonna take revenge. A good person who lives in a democracy recognizes this is really important and this is ties into the Aristotle stuff too. We are social and political beings by nature. We absolutely need a system of law and order to survive, right? We're, we're just so fundamentally social creatures because we're born in such a primitive state. It takes years and years to get a kid up to zero. And, con and culture involves lots of sim relationships, social relationships, political relationships. All these things are things we completely depend on. And we depend on other people to perform their functions in relation to all these systems. Well, the more developed or civilized a society is, the more it needs the institutions and laws, okay? So, it's even more true than ever that I depend upon my car mechanic and my Xfinity computer person and all these people to do their jobs well and not to overcharge me. Um, and that's all just a matter of trust. So not only that, I depend on my teachers, I depend on my coaches, I depend on my mentors, I depend on just every authority figure you have not to abuse their authority or you get hurt. So it also, you need to step into your role and do it for the benefit of the rules. Um, people uh, are free to leave, but, but what Socrates says is, where would I go? I like this society better than any other society. Um, but if you stay, you have to abide by the laws and the decisions. So for Socrates, it wasn't the system that was the problem. Having a trial by jury when you're accused of a crime is a very good thing. It's just that what they accused him of and also the fact that he was found guilty was the corruption. The guilt was in the spirit of the people. It wasn't in the structure of the laws. Um, Okay, Socrates' answer, I would lose a friend. Well, you'll always remember me, and you'll remember me as someone who followed reason and lived by principles. People will think I was too cheap. It doesn't matter what people think. It matters what's right. Where your friends are willing to risk getting into trouble, well, we'll be perceived as irresponsible hypocrites. Nobody will pay any attention to the, what I'm trying to teach people about how to live. 
There's other places to go. No, there really aren't. You need to think about that. You're playing into the enemies. The enemies are going to uh, demonize me anyway. You're betraying your children. Well, that was a problem, right? So I trust you, Crito, to raise them for me. All right. So everybody needs to have a reaction. Anybody want to start? Michael, do you want to start with any additional stuff beyond what you said? Uh, yeah, I'll start. Sorry, I was trying to pull that up. Uh, um, well, I'll just take Sorry. Okay. So um, I kind of thought that I know we already discussed it, but the reason number two, um, when he was talking about how people would uh, basically think more more poorly of uh, Crido uh, for not getting him out, I kind of thought that that was interesting, um, uh, just to see like how much like uh, how much others perceived image of him like matters, uh, if that makes sense. Um, because like today, like with social media and whatnot, like obviously our perceived image is like very, very, very important to people, yada, yada. But like at that time, I was somewhat surprised to see it like, because I, 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 I do believe that if um, he didn't help him ex escape, then people probably would think that Crido was too cheap, um, which is kind of, that kind of blows my mind. Like, uh, well, uh, why is this even, why is this even something you guys are even considering? Yeah, not only they're not considering it, they expect it. Right. Well, then the other thing is, is that true in the U.S.? <laughs> I leave it there. <laughs> I think it's more along the line, in like U.S. at least. I find that it's better sometimes, like if you have a rich kid who has never been held accountable, if their parents are like, no, you can handle that. Like, I find that more admirable than someone being like, my my Michael can do nothing wrong. Sorry, Michael, <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but like, to go off what, uh, what Michael was saying, like, I think reputation almost mattered more back then because your word was it that's the only thing people could trust about you and if like you didn't have your word or other people's word to back you up there wasn't like you couldn't you didn't have a linkedin for people to see like your references and stuff it's only based on what people thought of you so i think it was if anything it's interesting that that was like one of the first things he thought of you know a little selfish but it, it's still interesting that it was there at all Okay, what else, Jordan, did you get out of this um, line of reasoning? I think that whenever he was saying you're playing into the enemy's hands, I don't necessarily see that. I see that like he's being a martyr. You know, he's dying for what he believes in. And I think that people are going to believe in that more than someone who simply runs away from something. Like, I personally would feel more conviction with someone who died for their beliefs right rightly or wrongly you know what I mean like I don't feel like everyone needs to die for their beliefs but I feel like that person has more conviction in what they're saying um and I think that if he didn't die someone else would have been the scapegoat and I think that Socrates knew that and with his children I personally like my grandmother marched in marches and my dad had to have the repercussions of that but since she he he knew what she was doing in order to benefit him he didn't really care about that like and i think that if you want your child to have a better future you need to fight for that regardless of anything else so. good what marches did she march in um she's from little rock she said that she uh marched she's also a teacher so she marched to like help uh you know those people who were like were trying to pro provide help for uh I Immig forgot what school. What? Illegal immigrants? Undocumented workers? No. So this was like in the 60s. So it was oh. for uh, the uh, when integration was happening. 
So okay. yeah, the, I don't know any specifics. Sorry, but yeah. Well, that's okay. Um, the the school was being desegregated in Little Rock. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, uh, Michael. What did you want to say? I was just going to agree with Jordan. I think that had he not kind of followed through, uh, we wouldn't be talking about him right now. I don't even think that it, we would even know who Socrates was. Uh, so. Somebody else. Uh, yeah, I'll just kind of add on to that. Uh, especially like going into like kind of doing what you believe in, uh, kind of a crazy story. Uh, I'm from, I, I, uh, I'm from Hoxie, Hoxie high school. It's in, uh, Northeast Arkansas, and actually Hoxie was the first school in the South to integrate. And my great grandpa was actually on the school or on the school board that voted to integrate. So, uh, and like, there's a whole story about it and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, we like, we've learned about it like growing up and like we had like these uh, festivals and stuff like that to kind of show that. But yeah, I think it's just uh, a big thing uh, to just kind of stand up what you believe in because like they got a lot like, well, within the community actually, like there wasn't a whole lot of backlash, you know, like, everybody was, was pretty accepting of it and uh until like a reporter came and you know they just kind of widespread across the nation back then and you know obviously uh it got backlash then but uh I just think for them to do that just kind of just put well obviously there's other case scenarios but like just like standing up for what you believe in just doing those steps I believe is a big deal okay good can you yeah okay good who else? Who wants to go next? I can. So looking at the argument, what stood out to me would be uh, his reason three and how he was scared his friends were going to get in trouble. I understand that because your actions, I always taught your actions have consequences and the consequences might not always be on you. It might be on the ones you, you surround yourself with. And of um, course, I know he was. I can understand from his viewpoint of why he was so worried about his friends and everyone. Like, because he trusts his friends to raise his kids. So, if his friends got in trouble and something happened to his friends, then who would be? It would go through on this like spiral in my head personally about why I should and shouldn't do this and why this is wrong. But when he, when his, um, when Socrates is respond, responds, oh, well, not when Socrates, when Crypto responds, he goes, we're willing to risk our lives for what you believe in and to help you out. That, if personally, if that happened, if someone said that to me, that would personally touch me deeper than I would think. Because I think about it in my own personal standings, how my younger sister, she didn't have much of a social life during at school because she would want to go hang out with her friends on the weekend. Well, sorry, Lexi's got a soccer game in Atlanta all weekend. You can't go. Like, she gave up her social life and a part of her life for me. And that impacts me every day. I couldn't imagine if someone had to die for me, like he is thinking in this situation. So that was just like, an, oh my, personally, I wouldn't go through it because I wouldn't want to risk others. But he still did it, still is like, it. I, I don't know what's the word. No, it's not envy, it's, I sympathize and I congratulate him for having that courage to do so. Well, the question then is what about breaking laws, you know? So it gets, when it affects the political life, but anyway, yeah, it is a problem between your people close to you and then the society as a whole. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan. I'm like currently trying to find something like new because I'm like I don't want to keep repeating what everybody's saying because like literally everybody said most of the things that I was thinking I mean from um Jordan talking about the martyr and and what Lex just said um I mean I don't know uh oh Lex said earlier about how actions have consequences uh, <clears throat> sorry like I I don't know I think it's admirable for him to like, you know, the idea or just the idea in general of like, like doing something so that your friend doesn't get in trouble or whatever. I don't know. I'm so I'm somebody big on like accountability. So like if somebody does something and they know what they did was wrong and they're like wrongly accused for it, 
I would tell my friend that they need to own up to it and let them have the choice to own up to it. But then it's going to come to a certain point where if it's going to jeopardize my future or jeopardize something that I worked hard to build and I didn't make that conscious decision to either break the law. Like, for example, I think this is something maybe everybody might be able to resonate with. Like, for example, if you're with a friend and like either they had like weed or like, you know, you're underage and it's like, whose weed was it or whose alcohol was it? And you'd be like, would you take the blame for your friend? I'm just gonna be honest, I wouldn't. I would tell my friend, you better own up to it because I'm not getting in trouble for it because I don't do any of that stuff, you know? So, um, you know, I have just somebody on accountability and big on accountability. So I just feel like I would definitely give my friend the option to do it first. Like I wouldn't just like rat them out because they're my friend, like I care about them. <laughs> but I would say like, hey, you better own up to it because you owe me that. So like, it goes both ways. Like if your friend wouldn't take accountability for something they did, then why would you take the why would you take the blame for them if they wouldn't do it for you? So that's just kind of how I see it. It just gets more complicated. What if you know at work somebody's kind of fudging on the laws or the policies, right? Or I mean, there's it just gets more and more at stake over time. Does that make sense, Ryan? Yeah. And so this is a lifelong problem uh, you have to deal with. I've avoided that in a lot of ways. College professors tend to be more isolated than other people, but especially once you get tenure. Um, but I do know that it's complicated and it's permanent. That's what I want to say. You need to keep this argument in your head because these issues are going to keep coming up in different contexts in your life. Um, Tim, what about you? What struck you about that, the argument or the issue? <clears throat> so what struck me was, well, personally, I believe if you die for what you believe in, I, I believe that more than somebody saying, like, you play into their hands. But if, if you go for what you believe in, it's kind of more noble to what, that's what I think at least. That's what it kind of struck out to me, how you could say they're playing into their hands, but going for what they believe. Okay. And uh, Colin, what do you think? Um, I agree with Tim, but at the same time, since he's being so revolutionary in his thoughts and things of that nature, dying at that point of time would be a shame. I'm not saying get out and like hide from the law but if he still like does his own preachings and sp uh, like spurs his own ideas he can't that's that's the thing he has to go somewhere where nobody where that's lawless or else he would get repatriated he would get sent back does that make sense yeah it would just have to cause him to leave greece or things of that nature but if he could do that, sure. But if not, I guess if he's fine with dying and becoming a martyr for his cause, sure, go for it. It's not my life. That's your life that you're going to lose. Well, today, if you broke the law and went underground, if you went to Europe, they'd, they'd find you and they'd send you back. So you'd have to go to some super remote place. Is that what you want for your family? Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, if that was me, I would I would probably still leave and try to either go under a different al uh, alias or something of that nature because they don't have physical pictures. They have paintings that are black and white. If there's any way to change your appearance or things of that nature, I think he can do it. I mean, I, but would I know he it's want crazy. His kids. his kids would have no future. Um, I think they'll learn. Like, I think they'll get, they'll have shun. Not if he doesn't uh, relinquish his morals. <laughs> like, it, like, it's already gone, but like at the same time, I just say, just keep going, keep doing you. I mean, at that point, you're going to die. I personally wouldn't want to die. Oh, nobody does. <laughs> okay. I think there's also a point you got, like, you think about, movements don't 
like often only become to fruition because someone dies for it. Like the civil rights movement, most of America was not behind it until Martin Luther King was assassinated. Um, so things like that, they kind of need something to like fuel them to like, oh, this is like something that's serious that people need to pay attention to and to give weight to it. Which is unfortunate that we have, someone has to give their life for that. But I think like Nelson Mandela on top of that, he died and it brought like an end to an apartheid partially because of his sacrifices for Oh, no, he went to prison. He didn't he, die. He, I know he did, sorry. He went to prison for his beliefs, which right. is the second worst thing that could happen. I mean, right. sorry, he also went to prison, but he went to prison to try and end the apartheid and it actually caused change in, in the situation. I think that people making sacrifices of their own life really makes people think of the value of their argument. Right, but they're not asking. They didn't try to become a martyr, right? I don't think Socrates was just egging them on so that he could be a martyr, right? Does everybody understand that? Um, all right, so just try to keep in mind what sort of cases would I, could I get into and what would I do? How do I anticipate this? So when it actually happens, you go, okay, I've thought about this. Does it, you know, so it doesn't just hit you totally blindsided. Um, but still, it's very difficult to make those choices in a critical situation. Um, all right, so let's do the virtues here. Um, and I, as many of you said, they're pretty basic. Um, eating, drinking, and sex. All right, so some examples would be um, self-control in relation to eating. And there's lots of data about how greed is undermining our food system. So if you make more money if you put sugar, corn syrup, fat, salt, and it's killing people, literally killing people, right? It causes diabetes and heart disease. But, you know, people should have self-control and that's great. It's just, we have to be conscientious about this because it's not, we can't just naturally eat and we won't overeat. We'll eat all the right things. So, I mean, if you rationally eat the right thing for the right reason in the right way at the right time and all that wonderful stuff, you balance your proteins with your carbs and all that. There's so much research about this, right? But it's hard. So a rational person not only does it right, and there's different foods you can eat and all that sort of stuff, but they take pleasure in it. They don't really want more than they can eat. They don't really want sweets. They don't really, you know, that would be the ultimate integrity that you actually want to do what's best and you know what's best. Okay, what about drinking? Um, too much, too little, the mean. Aristotle would not advocate abstinence, drinking in moderation. Um, and then people disagree about what's moderate. <laughs> I only drink on holidays. I only drink on weekends. I only drink at night. I only have one beer before philosophy class and it makes a lot more sense, right? Uh, so people disagree. <laughs> on how much is too much, but, you know, we do have research about people who are in denial about their dependency on alcoholism, on alcohol. And so, uh, you know, there's lots of research, lots of discussion. 7% um, of the people in the world are chemically, their bodies are oriented toward alcoholism. They have a tendency to become alcoholics. And given that every person has at least three other people that would depend very much on them and their alcoholism would, would seriously flaw their lives, 28% of a population is gonna be seriously affected by alcohol. This is why I don't drink. Um, it's for social and political reasons. It's just because of this fact about our bodies, but my children drink in moderation, fine. I'm not judgmental about it. 
I just want you to get a sense that it's not just a personal decision. It has a lot of ramifications. Um, and then there's studies of different countries, like the countries that have prohibition. Um, so the, the places where the college students come to college and just get binge drinking and, you know, get drunk all the time. The two places are uh, areas in the U.S. where they have had abstinence, right? Their parents don't allow them to drink or it's a dry county and Saudi Arabia. Like those are the kids that really go haul hog. And that just means you're going from repression to self-indulgence. So in Europe, kids drink at home socially and they learn how to drink in moderation. Well, but still you can look and see which customs are most effective at minimizing the, the percent of alcoholics. And at least this, the research I did, I mean, it's so hard to keep track, but Germany is accepting, but maybe too accepting because they do have problems with alcoholism more than some other countries. So you would want to look at, well, which level of acceptance and moderation tends to be most successful at preventing the binge, you know, repress binge cycle or minimizing people who are prone to alcoholism from actually falling into it? Is there some way to, to structure societies? And with sex, of course, too much, too little, the mean. Um, and Aristotle would advocate monogamy, I think, because we um, children need parents and they need that stability. They need the emotional stability. They need the economic stability. Now, one of the other things we disagree with is whether same sexual relation, sexual orientation is necessarily perverted and promiscuous. And research shows that it's not, right? You can, you can, your or sexual orientation does not make you perverted sexually or wicked sexually. It's the nature of the relationship you have with the other person. Are you abusive, <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's the quality of the relationship. It's not the plumbing, right? But people disagree with that. Okay, the next one, courage, fear. And fear is huge because we are extremely vulnerable and we're extremely aware that we're vulnerable. And we're vulnerable in a lot of different ways, right? Pain, fear of death, failure to succeed economically, uh, loss of social status, getting kicked out of society, ostracized. We're, all, we're afraid of a lot of stuff. And so politicians can really punch the fear button pretty easily. We're afraid of enemies attacking us. Um, but so a lot of people, when you're at a job and you see that the company's breaking the rules or that the boss is really lying about something or that the, that the way it's run is really sexist or racist, you know, you're afraid of failing economically. So you put up with it, right? rather than speak out. So these things happen. Um, I am undoubtedly, you will run into situations like this if you haven't already. Um, okay, and then the death one is also important because we have now, the last two years of people's lives, they spend a ton of money on keeping themselves alive. And it's creating all this debt that their grandchildren have to pick up, right? So um, I think people should be reflective about the fear of death and shouldn't fight it right to the end. Um, and I have on the tape about the 80-80-80 rule about, I think this is how it goes. If you're over 80 years old, it's going to cost 80,000 bucks or more and you end up having no more than 80 days to live that they won't do the surgery. And I was like, who would do it? Is my opinion like, really? You would send that kind of a bill <laughs> to your children or grandchildren just to stay alive a few more months. So I don't know what you think about that, but 
that's an example of how the fear of death is driving profit you know everybody wants to make money and they can make money on keeping people who are afraid of death alive but it also is driving our country into the ground economically okay fear of pain um it has a lot of if you fear too much then um that's a huge problem okay because again we have all these opioids and all that and the opioids you know originally were started out with legitimate reasons for using them and then we have the addiction problem and then we have the profit motive gets in there and uh really screws thing up so anyway we can those there are lots of examples of how courage how fear drives societies into the ground generosity is really important because this is where when you were talking about um virtue I really want to emphasize that the American system has a radical individual kind of view of happiness, minimal government, whereas the Greeks really don't. We are social and political by nature. So generosity is necessary for us to acknowledge that we depend on each other and we love, we care for each other. We have trust and goodwill toward each other magnanimity is the is the wealthy they give in a big way and so bill gates and his billionaire friends are have given money to try and uh lead to carbon zero zero carbon so they're working on uh research and development all this stuff because the private sector the market has not responded to this why because there's other billionaires making money on fossil fuels and they give their money to political campaigns that um bribe right the politicians you can win this election but if you do i want you to legislate to maintain tax breaks for fossil fuels no tax breaks for green so there are two sets of billionaires really duking it out in terms of our future uh, sustainability. So that's an issue. Then there's a lot more magnanimity. Um, we have char charter schools that corporations help support them so they can have a higher quality of education for undersourced students. We have, there's lots of ways that philanthropy, theaters, symphonies, um, all sorts of the arts is philanthropy, big time philanthropy, even temperedness, not too, not too angry. You get angry when it's appropriate, not too much, not too little. Rational ambition is what all of my students at Lyon have. They want to develop their talents. They want to succeed at a kind of work that uses their uh, abil abilities. Um, but again, that isn't just about me. The way you cultivate this is through your your relationships with other people. So two out of the 10 books in the ethics is all about relationships. Um, rational pride, knowing how to honor citizens. So there's always an honor day at every institution for people who go over and above what they get paid to do. And um, they're honored for that. Rational humor is you take serious things seriously, but you take yourself lightly. Um, so you don't become cynical, but and you don't mock out other people. There's some comedians that really feed stereotypes and it's unhealthy. There's other ones that trivialize everything and distract you from what's important. But the really good ones help you um, recognize some of the ignorant things you do without thinking about it and also help you keep things in perspective so you can stay focused on your goals rational friendships are really important you have a common desire to exercise the virtues and to deliberate with each other to talk about things like we talk about in this class right putting up with minor injustices um i'm trying to think of an example where it would be, I don't know, you got overcharged $5 for something, 
by accident and someone's gonna, I don't know, just stuff that you just don't make a big deal out of it at some point. Um, truthfulness, this is important, knowing yourself. Know who you are, right? Know what you're good at and also what you know and what you don't know. That's what was Socrates. Um, and Tim pointed that out. Someone who's good at making shoes is great, but just because they're good at making shoes and they're also, they vote, doesn't mean they know everything. What, they don't even have to get informed about how to vote. Okay, so the political virtues we'll get into more later on in the next section of the class, but this is the economic sector, figuring out how to regulate the business sector so that we have a middle class, how to make laws um, that bring people together. Does we get rewarded for getting along with people? How to distribute wealth so that you have a middle class, how to allocate resources. Um, I think especially education is a big deal in our time in America, that we need to have a good system of public education so that everybody gets to develop their capacities. Um, punishing wrongdoing, we've already talked about that. It's a system that's rehabilitative, right? You try to re rehabilitate people and so they can move on and flourish instead of being punitive. And also you try to prevent problems. You try to give everyone equal representation. Okay, equity is knowing how to apply the laws. So this is what the jury in Socrates' case did not do well, right? The laws themselves might not have been bad, but applying them was bad. Um, also the law of not believing that these two things he was accused of had not been brought to court before because everybody could have whatever beliefs they want before the society collapsed. And then all of a sudden somebody finds some old law that says, hey, wait, he doesn't believe in the city's God. Someone will say, that's against the law in Athens? That's nuts. But, you know, they found it and they can accuse him. Um, and then knowing what to do in the situation. So we can talk about stuff a lot, but what about in the critical situation? Knowing how to figure out what the options are. And, you know, when you get in a situation where you're making a decision, Sometimes you think like there's three choices and somebody else says, wait a sec, there's another choice. You're leaving something out. Or someone will say one of those choices is just not really a choice. And then, but always the goal is to maximize flourishing for everybody who's affected by the choice. And you would also be able to know why, and you would also be able to persuade other people. So these are, this is really difficult. Practical wisdom is really difficult, uses a lot of capacities. And then you have the intellectual ones, the art of creating things like craftsmanship, technical schools, but the art of, um, um, yeah, I mean, you can evaluate those. You can have shoes that are actually functional and then you can have the pointed toe high heels one that basically ruin women's feet. <laughs> oh, that's done for money. So that's a corruption of that skill of knowing how to make shoes. Um, same with cooking. Intellectual virtues. This is what you associate with going to school is math, um, science, um, knowledge, you know, just going to a class and learning a lot of knowledge. And a lot of your classes are like that. And you take a test. But at Lyon, actually, a lot of them, you apply um, of a knowledge base to a situation. It's just that this class has, this class doesn't start with a lot of knowledge, but it's, it's really focusing on analogies and patterns in human affairs. And then any one situation you make, you probably, you would need to have more research to know what's best. But what I teach is that life is complicated and and even when get just getting knowledge is not going to necessarily solve a problem so um all right so i want each of you to comment on some aspect of the virtues the one reaction i have to what you said before is that life liberty and the pursuit of happiness the, the um founders 
had a much more individualistic view, although, I mean, some of them did and some of them didn't. They had a minimal government. Government was just for military and police. And today, I just think there's an argument. If we want a middle class, we need to have a lot more redistribution of wealth because people can't just cut down trees and grow plants and have a homestead and be middle class. It takes like a college education, take, take 16 years of education to be able to get a middle class job. And so you do need to tax the rich and provide opportunities for everybody else in order to have that. Plus healthcare is way more expensive than it used to be. You know, it used to be someone cut off my arm, so I'll go get a, I mean, it didn't cost money at all. Now it does. Like if you want people to have access to any kind of healthcare, you're going to have to tax the, hopefully the rich. It should be, there's progressive taxes, which are you pay more according to your income and there's regressive taxes, which is everybody pays the same. Like if you had tax on certain foods, uh, ne necessary foods, milk and bread or something, then it doesn't matter. That's a regressive tax because it costs the, the poor a lot more percentage of their money than it costs the rich. So some kinds of equality of taxing just is not appropriate and it's going to shrink the middle class more. Okay, um, Zane, let me start with you, unless somebody wants to start. Uh, one second, I'm looking at the article real quick. Okay, anybody want to start? I'm trying to find the article now. Where is it? Because I'm struggling to find it. Okay, but you could, you could just take notes on what I said, rather, you know, that's okay. Um, does anybody yeah. want to react to what I said? Yeah, um, to note with like the, I think it was like megalomaniac or something like that, or the rich person. Magnanimity. magnanimity. Yeah, magnanimity, anonymity, whatever. But um, I think that that used to be the case. It used to be something where like rich people would be art benefactors. They would be like very well funding public projects. But I think the more we move into the future, the less we see that. And like what we were talking about last week, which is like how humanities often get cut. Like these things are the first to go because they don't see any um, monistic value in them. And I think that if we really want to like get into the nitty gritty of it, they don't care. They don't give a shit about us. They don't like they, they don't want anything else besides to look well enough for us to continue to buy whatever product they're pushing. And if we really want to see a shift in that in current day, we have to give them something that would like monistically make them want to change. Like if we stop supporting a certain brand, which we have done before, simply because they didn't hold values that we like. That's like the voice of the people, the voice of the market. Yeah. Okay. And I think I said last time that one of the incentives for rich people to give their money away is that it, it's taxed 91%, you know, the wealth. And so, of course, they gave money away and got a tax break, right? So they wouldn't have to pay that. And then the next one was 75%. 91 under uh, uh, Eisenhower, 71 under Nixon, 50 under Reagan, 35 under George W, 17 under Trump. So the rich are not getting taxed. And so they don't have an incentive to give money away. So that's a problem. Another problem is the campaign finance, that there used to be limits on how much money you could contribute to political campaigns. And now that's just huge. So a lot of the wealthy money is going to buy political candidates. And then the public says, gee, these political ca candidates, all they do is whatever their donors. Well, I to me, like that still some of them are a lot better than others because some donors have, have better goals than others, I think. But the system has been set up that way now. So now what are we supposed to do? And it has changed things quite a bit. Um, 
But Ryan, what would you like to say? Um, just speaking on that, I think it's just really hard because like to find the balance between giving, I mean, just our basic rights, right? We were talking about like liberty, pursuit of happiness, all of those things. Like for me, like like the amount of money that people have in in some cases is because they worked for it or they just got lucky or whatever, but at the end of the day, it's their money. So it's, it's hard to find a balance between giving those people those rights, but then also trying to make society because I think at the end of the day this is a system like issue like we talked about boycotting certain like products certain brands but in terms of like for example like shortening or or making the middle class bigger um that's like a system like systemic sorry I can't even speak right now a systemic issue because it's like there's no clarity like where like I think at least for me uh, at least for my family, it's just hard. Um, and in people that I've talked to, it's like, where does tax money go? I can speak for Hawaii in general. For us, we had this thing called the rail and it was supposed to be for the public. So basically it's like a, it's like a, like a shuttle that would take people around the island and stuff like that. And it's been like almost 10 years in the making and it's still not even made. And it took like millions of dollars. And where is that money going to and it's not even running and it's not even benefiting the people even if it is in the future it's like a lot of people disagreed with it and they still made it so it's like it's hard because there's no clarity in terms of that and that's why I feel like it's a system failure and then it's also hard to balance between giving people their rights for their money their property their assets what they you know they were lucky they it bit like they bet on bitcoin or they bought a bitcoin they got lucky and now they have billions of dollars it's like who are we to take away their luck and their assets like for me right but then it's also like society and our world literally doesn't work right now like but i typed earlier just the idea of what did i say it pretty much only works because everybody's on board like we can't have some people giving taxes or some people helping out in society and then other people not like people being individualistic but then other people want to help because then I feel like that's where society collapses because we can't just have some people wanting the betterment ish but then again it's never going to work I feel like because it's it's the world so it gets worse though I mean in the 60s the CEO made 60 times more than the receptionist yeah and how much more do you think they should make I mean do they work 60 times harder Anyway, now they make, they make like 300 times more now. What? They make like 900 times. Oh, 900. More. Okay. The last I heard was 350, oh, but exactly. okay. Uh, it's way, way, way more. So the disparity is much more than it used to be. And the tax is a lot less than it used to be. So, so I do think getting the bigger picture is important. Um, but uh, Colin, what do you think in terms of any of these virtues? We don't, you can go back to the personal virtues. You can just pick any of anything that struck you. The rational humor. Okay. It's intriguing to say the least because some of these comedians, some of the more controversial ones like Dave Chappelle, um, that's their way of making revenue. That is their livelihood. That is their life now. Um, Kevin Hart, all of these people. It's, I don't want to say it. it's sad. There is a line and sometimes they do cross it, but then there are, some things that they do say that aren't crossing the line that this cancel culture is trying to in their whole entire reputation and their lives. Okay, so another polarization thing. So Will Smith situation, okay. Okay, that's my job isn't to have an opinion on this. It's just to have you point out that comedians play a role in society and they have a talent and it can be used to help people become more self-aware to actually educate or it can be corrupted and go ahead jordan well in his example of dave chappelle trans people are attacked more, more the united states than ever like and dave chappelle reiterates this humor that makes it okay almost 
because okay. it's like so like what you were talking about they they have a place in society that gives them a role that gives them a bigger audience and if you kind of joke about that thing it makes it okay okay and, and no one can say you can't say that that's public speech but I think they also have like a responsibility almost to understand what their words will do to other people that's a big issue should you self-correct for your speech that was a big issue in Athens too okay very good that's exactly right Ryan and that's what I want that's to me the benefit of this list is it gets your mind going, right, uh, Michael? I was going to say just on the uh, back on to like the comedian thing. Um, when I was taking, I think, like social psychology, um, we watched some we watched some comedians who basically um, uh, joked about like stereotypes that that befall like their own like like race, for example um and so it's kind of like uh i don't know it's kind of under that same umbrella except that now the person that's making these jokes is making jokes about themselves you know and that's almost uh it, it, it's different it's much different than you know not being a trans individual and then joking about some about trans individuals but at the same time um i don't know i don't know that kind of always rubbed me the, rubbed me the wrong way about what I think there's like a line about punching up and punching down. You know what I mean? Like as a Jewish person, I can make certain comments about Jewish people that as Gentiles, y'all cannot. It's just simply very different. Or like when a woman calls another woman a bitch or the C word, it's very different than a man calling a woman a, the B word or, you know, all that. Right. And I Jewish agree. With you. I think it has to do with kind of like the, the power gradient, if you will, uh, kind of like you were just saying. But at the same time, is it right that um someone who is black can make it like obviously they can but is it right that they should make a stereotyping joke about their own race that then the entire audience is going to laugh at which kind of goes back to what you were originally talking about jordan and supporting continuing to kind of support these stereotypes that's the thing though i believe that it's kind of different when it's oneself making the joke than another like my entire family has made the joke multiple times that when I'm at a family reunion I eat as much watermelon and chicken as I ever want and I don't care and if the joke it's the stereotype black people like watermelon chicken it's it doesn't depend on the person it depends on the tone the situation and the actions behind it if you get what I'm saying because I'm going to hear that I'm going to hear stereotypes and I'm going to hear certain things from people all over. I've heard very abusive and stereotypical stuff from Lyon College itself. I hear it all the time, but it's different when I hear Ryan make the joke. Gosh, Lexi, you're like, oh my gosh, Lexi, look, it's another black girl. She's fast. You got to watch out for her. That's a joke we make on the soccer field all the time. It's whatever. It's different when another white person or like say a white person comes up to me and goes, why don't you go shut up and eat some chicken or something like that? Like it's, it depends on the tone and the situation. So you would have to take that one in a different context. It wouldn't fit in the situation that we're talking about. Tim, what about you? Well, from, <clears throat> from what I've heard, like personally, if a joke or um, like the stuff people say, it's really how they say it, because what they say shouldn't apply or like really infest your mind, but depending on who you're talking to, because like like Lexi said, black people make jokes all the time. But if you make a joke about somebody else and they're not black, it's like it's kind of different, even though it's, it might be the same joke. It's like it's really just how you interpret it. Cause personally, when certain people say jokes about black people, we just shrug it off. And so like, like, like comedians, personally, I think if you're a comedian, there are no limits. Cause like, I forgot who in here said it, Dave Chappelle, he gets so much ridicule for it. But if you're a comedian, you know, you can't have limits. The whole point of it is to make people laugh. Even though it might hurt some people, you know what you signed up for if you go to the show though. 
is if you don't have if you have limitations, then probably will die out after a while. You gotta, you gotta make a um think of new things. It's wrong, but it's also it's how you take it. Because you could say a very racist joke to me, and I just would laugh. But if you say a very racist joke to somebody who's more sensitive to me, they'll take it like really personal. So, I mean, that's just what I think, though. Well, I I think that um, if if jokes can be educational, then you know a good comedian would dedicate his work to making sure whatever they do is educational and not letting it corrupted by money or status. And, you know, you can easily take that skill and, and make more money by saying things that would polarize us again. And polarization is not a good thing. Um, all right, Zane, what about you? And then we'll be done. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm just going to kind of go down one to rational friendships, kind of like it says, bonding with someone else based on, you know, common desire to exercise one of the virtues to inspire each other and live in a higher, higher quality of life that stuck out to me just because, like, it seems like, you know, friendships and people, you know, is kind of like uh, kind of like what runs a lot of stuff you know, and like a lot of, you know, uh, career fields you'll hear, like, you know, it's not about like what you know, but it's about like who you know and like those friendships and just those connections, uh, I believe is like a big deal. So I just found that uh, important. Yeah, well, if the friendships turn out to be mostly driven by power and money, then there's people who don't have access to those networks and they can work just as hard and be just as talented, but they don't get access to the network. And that's a big problem. Okay. Uh, Okay, um, so uh, let's see. Oh yeah, let me just give one example of um, systemic problems. Like, well, let me just put it, I guess I, I, it's time to go. So I did read a bunch of books about broader issues in our society and I made a reading group. And if you wanna get invited into it, to just check out some of the books and I have maybe 40 pages scanned from each book because one of the students said she wants to she thought when she came to Lyon people would be talking about these serious things and they weren't so I do have that there's stuff about what's happened since Reagan basically in terms of distribution of wealth and also our torture program there's stuff on our educational program there's just, you know, a hodgepodge of stuff. I, I, there's who, whose presidents appoint to be the heads of these um, departments in Washington, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Education, stuff like that, and what qualifications they had and what they do with their power and stuff like that. So I tend to vote on the basis of that, who they would be likely to appoint to their cabinet. But anyway, if any of you are interested, that's good. Um, so for next time, I just want you to go to the next, right, the next post, and it will be, oh, well, we still need to talk about Jesus and Socrates. Um, then we start, oh, we start, we also have to talk about Newland. Um, so now we read from the book Einstein's God, and we have um, Taking Revenge, The Soul and Depression Stress, and actually, there's another one too, the biology of the spirit. So there's really four articles, and this is horrible, I understand. Um, but do what you can, and maybe read at least two, and come prepared to talk about those two. Does that make everybody okay with that? Any questions? There's also a paper due, which again, is just like, this is horrible. But um, Ryan handed in a draft and I hope she understands my comments, but I won't make that paper due until, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, I don't care. It's just, it does need to come in. It's a thousand words. It doesn't have to be that long. And um, I'm trying to, uh, you don't have to do everything, but, I, but at least I'm presenting what you would have gotten in a regular semester. 
but I'm not going to be totally slave, uh, I should say, totally authoritarian on this, okay? I don't want to say slave driver. I don't think it should say that, you know? I think, I mean, it's not bad. It's just authoritarianism is what it is. And that's what I mean, <laughs> absolutist. All right, um, take care. <laughs>